Good morning. I'm Jim Perkins, and I welcome you to the second year of the OLLI program series, Foreign Cultures and American Foreign Policy. We are video recording all the program sessions, including the question and answer session. The videos will be used for educational purposes in our school system, as we've received requests for these videos from schools, including UVA. And we will have a question and answer session at the conclusion of Professor Thompson's presentation as the professors have agreed to video these as well because they can become an important part of the information provided. And we will use those microphones over here uh, at the side. So please queue up and step right up to the mics. There's one mic is for the uh, audience and the other mic is for our, our recording. So we ask that you step up close so everybody can hear those. And at this time, I want to acknowledge uh, the students from Tandem School and from Miller School of Albemarle. And these students are here, compliments of Ollie. Would you please raise your hands wherever you're sitting? Over here and over here. Thank you very much for coming. During my 25-year naval career, I traveled to many foreign countries, and I was struck by how little I knew about the true culture of these countries. I was concerned about us as Americans and our relations with the people in whose country we were a guest as more and more countries became increasingly important to the United States due to global economies and conflicts, some of which were actual combat situations, I was even more concerned about our foreign policies, about how our knowledge, or lack thereof, about their cultures, how it was affecting our day-to-day -day relations with these people that our diplomats, tourists, servicemen, and women came in contact. Two years ago, on um, March the 10th, actually it was three years ago on March the 10th, 2010, I attended a conference at Monticello originated by Dr. Rui Ramazani, the Edward R. Statinius Professor Emeritus at UVA. He was the Professor of Government and Foreign Affairs in the Department of Politics at the University of Virginia. The forum was conducted by the American Academy of Diplomacy in Washington, D.C. and the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. Dr. Ramazani emphasized then the need in the United States for cultural education related to foreign policy making. The following fall, in September 10th, 2010, Ambassador Ryan Crocker spoke to the Miller Center, and he clearly stated that one of the lessons we must learn when dealing with foreign countries with whom we are about to engage in military conflict is, be careful what you get into. Very wise words. He also e emphasized that you must know the history, know how it is perceived in the country, and know how it, the history, informs the present within the minds of the people we are going to be dealing with. He said, know the culture, know the language, and he also said, know how to get out of the situation. You must know the literature, the fiction, the poetry, the fairy tales, what myths the parents tell their children. Now, these two presentations and my own experiences triggered in me the idea that education was certainly needed uh, to inform the public. And working as a volunteer with OLLI, I thought that this was a natural place to start, and I approached Professor Ramazani about my idea of a program at OLLI and asked his support. He responded by stating, and I quote, I would be happy to, act, to uh, advise on what I call the culture deficit in the United States foreign policy making. And to overcome this daunting predicament, your idea of a course or a program at OLLI would be a great start. I proposed the idea to the OLLI program chair, Elliot Minenberg, whom many of you know, whose committee approved the concept. And Dr. Ramazani contacted Dr. Alan Lynch at UVA, Department of Politics, who obtained the five more professors, including himself, all experts in their respective countries' cultures. And with lots of hard work by Joan Kahmeyer, who's here today, the president now of OLLI, and her staff, we presented the spring program 2012. And this was a six-week program, Foreign Cultures and American Foreign Policy. Ramazani, Professor Ramazani, uh, stated that we needed a mission statement. We needed an objective. And we uh, created this, which is as follows. Why is it important in our American national interest to know about foreign cultures when dealing with these countries in our American foreign policy. Former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright said it best in a speech addressed to diplomats and other officials on November the 30th in 2000. And she stressed, quote, cultural factors are utterly inseparable from foreign policy. 
And the more we know and understand about cultures of those with whom we interact, the more successful our policy will be. Therefore, the objective of the OLLI program, Foreign Cultures and American Foreign Policy, is to inform participants about foreign cultures and how they affect those countries' behavior and how that knowledge can create an enlightened American foreign policy. In this context, we wish to have presentations that examine foreign cultures and are focused on how they can affect our American policy. This program, the most popular OLLI program ever, registered 102 attendees uh, plus students last year. This year we have 110 registrants. In addition, we have high school students, as I've indicated. The videos are on iTunes U at UVA and available for free for anyone wishing to view them on the internet. Now at this time, it is my honor and privilege to introduce Today's lecturer, she is Professor Thompson, Associate Professor in the Department of History at the University of Virginia. Professor Thompson is an expert in 20th century Middle Eastern history with the social movements, their colonialism, the gender, public spheres, and cinema. She has a BA from Harvard and obtained her master's and PhD from Columbia. Originally from New Jersey, Elizabeth grew up in the Detroit, Michigan area and there she became fascinated by the Arab culture and the Muslims of the people whose ethnic background were Syrian and Lebanese. And she studied at the American University in Cairo and has traveled extensively in the Middle East. Professor Thompson has many awards for her work in Middle Eastern history. And last year in 2012, she was the co-director of the National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Seminar for University Professors. And the topic was World War I in the Middle East. She has written numerous books, articles, book chapters, and is currently working on another book. The title is Cinemas and the Politics of Late Colonialism. Her most recent book was just published this year and is now available. Uh, Elizabeth, you didn't have a copy yet. For you. Do you have one? OK, we'll, we'll get that out so you can see that. Um, it, it's just out. It really is uh, just fresh off the press. and. Um, this book is titled, Justice Interrupted, The Struggle for Constitutional Government in the Middle East, which Elizabeth admits is really a biography. <laughs> Harvard Press describes Justice Interrupted this way. The Arab Spring uprisings of 2011 were often portrayed in the media as a dawn of democracy in that region. But the revolutionaries were, and saw themselves as, heirs to a centuries-long struggle for just government and the rule of law, a struggle obstructed by local elites as well as the intervention of foreign powers. Elizabeth Thompson uncovers the deep roots of liberal constitutionalism in the Middle East through the remarkable stories of those who fought against poverty, tyranny, and foreign rule. Justice Interrupted just happens to be the topic of her presentation today. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Elizabeth Thompson. You're welcome. Let me make sure I've got this going for you. Make a little thing of water too. Okay, I'm all set. I'm gonna balance my water there. Oh, good morning. After that introduction, I better. I don't know. I have to <laughs> set a high standard for me. Thank you so much. Um, yes. Yeah, so thank you, and get, it is a great pleasure to be able to speak to you. Just I literally two days ago got my own first copy of the book. So. It's on my mind, and I'll share with you uh, perhaps the better part of wisdom after working five years on a book um, that I think speaks a bit to the political culture of the Middle East, if anything, the accumulated uh, wisdom, but also the memories of past interactions, not only with the United States, but people in the Middle East see the United States coming in you know, in the, um, uh, following the footprints left by European powers uh, a century ago. Um, the book, uh, as Mr. Perkins so graciously uh, noted from the publicity, is, uh, uh, explains how the current Arab Spring is not a discovery of democracy, you know, that it is heir to a century of struggle. Um, I tell the story through 
12 chapters focused on leaders of the largest movements that arose in the region uh, since the uh, 19th century. Two themes came out, and um, here maybe I'll, oh, I'm going to have to do, uh, well, uh, yeah, well, let's give you, pardon me while I master this very difficult technology pressing a button here. Um, two themes jumped out at me uh, uh, as I went through their stories and uh, read their speeches, their letters, their memoirs, and so on. One was that um, liberalism and constitutionalism were uh, responses, in fact, to engagement with Europeans that was often bruising in its inequality, you know, the use of force was much more superior on the part of Europeans, and in the deaf ear that Europeans turned toward uh, the peoples of the region, but also in the ways in which they saw their own kings, their own sultans, their Shah, the Shah of Iran, uh, engage and make deals with European diplomats and businessmen, uh, bartering away precious resources and rights of people over those resources and uh, over uh, their own livelihoods in many ways um, without any recourse. And so that while they drew inspiration and knew about, particularly the educated people by the end of the 19th century, um, knew about the French Revolution, the Ameri well, less, I see less evidence of the American Revolution, I'll confess. Um, it was in response to the situation facing them that their own leaders were more responsive to Europeans than to their own people that motivated them to build what were the largest political movements of the time. Um, I asked in each chapter how the leader was motivated first by a very particular perception of injustice uh, felt. They looked around in their lives and they said, this is not right, but they went further. It wasn't just right, not right because it was a misfortune, a bad luck, but because it was um, someone was responsible for it and it contravened some basic values held at that time. Um, one of the things I tried to do in the book was to show how the concept of justice is a fluid one and one that changes historically over time and place. So each, each I paid attention to each leader in his time and place, and, and, or hers. There are a couple women in there, too. Um, and then I looked at how they formulated new ideals of justice in response to that injustice that they felt they saw. And often it was tyranny, the poverty, a growing inequality. The Middle East had not been, historically, a place where there was an aristocracy of great wealth and a surf you know, a class of serfs beneath them. It was unlike Russia and China. Indeed, um, there was a much more egalitarian distribution of wealth historically. And so the growth of inequality in the 19th century was a great motivating factor, I found. Um, and so they used an ideal of equality, of rule of law against the capriciousness of rulers who would make deals with Europe. Um, uh, uh, so rule of law, equality, uh, and, a, and a sense that uh, people should participate in government were messages that sound very much like the kinds of political ideals that you might read about in Europe or the United States in the 19th century as well. But what struck me was these were the ideals that motivated large numbers of people in the Middle East to take risks, to go out into the street, to protest, to sign their names to petitions at risk of arrest, right? And I quickly realized, wow, the values that people actually acted on don't look so strange, right? Uh, when I was introduced to the field of Middle Eastern history or when we read in the press about the Quran and Islam and we're not sure what that is and we have translations with sort of very exotic sounding language, uh, it, it sort of reinforces an expectation that people have really different values. So part of the story in this book is to tell the story of how the values people actually acted on are quite recognizable to us in the United States. A second theme I developed was to look at the impact of foreign intervention in the region. First, on domestic politics and the fate of these liberal movements, and second, 
on the structures of government and um, the growth, in, particularly um, over the 20th century, in the use of political violence. And uh, my conclusion is not so different from many of the people in my field, that intervention has historically had, on balance it seems, I'm sorry to say, a negative influence. It has not promoted democracy. And so I sat, you can imagine, here I am, um, starting the book long ago, this, the, the origins of this book go back a decade, uh, and I watched uh, our president, George Bush, uh, announce the plan to uh, in, invade uh, Iraq and spread democracy. Those are great ideals, no doubt. But then I saw in the front row, or the second row perhaps, my memory is fuzzy now, uh, Tony Blair, uh, you know, the leader of uh, Britain. And I groaned inside. George Bush, as Mr. Perkins pointed out, our memories and our knowledge of the uh, politics of the places we go and the culture uh, is imperfect perhaps had no idea that any Iraqi looking at that speech, seeing the leader of Great Britain nodding and smiling, would immediately remember a moment in 1917 when a British general came into Baghdad and promised that uh, the British were here only to liberate the Iraqis from the tyranny of the Ottoman Turks. And then they stayed right, and uh, built a colonial regime that was anything but liberating or democratic indeed. And so uh, it is with that sort of sensitivity and, and purpose that I accepted a, um, an award that started this book um, from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, which encouraged specialists like myself to write for a broader audience and to tell the story from the viewpoint of those who lived in the Middle East and worked for uh, constitutional government, uh, equality, uh, and rule of law in their own words. And so I'm going to give you today, um, uh, I'm going to give you the briefest of personal introductions because I've been introduced so kindly, um, and introduce you, and give you a sort of bird's eye view of the book. I will end, however, with a look at um, a profile of a particular man that I grew fond of as I wrote about him, a Syrian, um, who uh, who was engaged in the founding of the Ba'ath Party in the 1950s, but a very different Ba'ath Party from the one that rules now uh, in a bloody dictatorship in Syria. And I think that the story of his career kind of encapsulates uh, much about what those in the Arab Spring are trying to retrieve, that sense of justice having been interrupted, that, uh, that the Ba'ath Party was once a force for constitutional government and became a military dictatorship is a story not just involving Syrians, but directly involving other Arabs in the region, but most directly the confrontation of the United States with the Soviets uh, during the Cold War. All right. So briefly, um, uh, by way of personal introduction, I came to this book, um, well, I guess first and foremost, by serving uh, at the American University in Cairo in 1982. Uh, as an intern in the president's office, uh, sort of learning uh, front and center how much Americans have done uh, in the past century and a half to, to spread education in that region. And that that is probably the interaction with Americans that Arabs most value. And um, went very far, I will say, in um, encouraging them to give us the benefit of the doubt, if you will. Long into the 20th century, and even when I was there in the 1980s, at a time when people were beginning to grow a bit frustrated that the peace with Israel had not brought better conditions for Palestinians, uh, when Islamic movements were beginning to grow because the economy was souring, and there was a sense that, that people would tell me about the big tower built by the US Agency for International Development, and they were convinced that those people who were there to distribute the aid we had promised Egypt in the wake of the peace with Israel, Egypt and Israel remain 
the countries that receive our highest levels of foreign aid to this date. Um, after signing that peace treaty in 1979, they were convinced that those entrusted to distribute those funds were all CIA spies and that they were using that program to control Egypt, right? a theme that, will, that came up again in the 2011 revolution. And I noticed and I was interested in the suspicion behind what seemed to me very good motives on the parts of Americans. And perhaps that led me to, let me show you another uh, book. Oh, here, let's take a look at the um, uh, map just to familiarize yourself. I don't know, may I see a, a show of hands? How many of you feel you know the geography of the Middle East at all? How many of you have never thought about the Middle East? Right, let's do it this way. How, how many of you do not know the first thing about the Middle East and when you look at a map, uh, uh, you're baffled. Good. All right. So let's, uh, let's, um, let's review geography before I plunge further, and I'll tell you, you know, where I've studied and where we're going to go in my talk, right? There on your left, of course, is Egypt. This is all on the eastern end of the uh, Mediterranean. Cairo is the largest city in the Arab world. Egypt is the largest country in the Arab world today. Um, and uh, then just directly to the east of it, we see the state of Israel um, and a little green dot that is uh, supposed to be the West Bank and the Palestinian entity. We'll talk, we'll return to these uh, in a moment in a chapter about uh, the, as I tell you about the uh, beginnings of the Arab and Israeli conflict there after World War I. Jordan also created after World War I by the British as a mandate. To the north, Syria and Lebanon. Uh, this is where I did my first book. And in fact, I probably was inspired to do that book by my experience in Egypt. Uh, it is, uh, those two countries were created by France after World War I. These are all territories that had once been ruled by Turks up in what is now Turkey, right? And if you see Ankara is today the capital of Turkey. But if you look to the left, and a little bit north, you'll see the city of Istanbul, right? Istanbul lies across the Bosphorus Straits, which divide Europe from Asia, and is the ancient city of Constantinople, which you know from Roman history and Emperor Constantine. Uh, it was conquered by the Ottoman Turks in 1453, and they ruled much of what we think of as the Arab world for 400 years, down to World War I. All right. So they ruled Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, Egypt, and the coast of the Arabian Peninsula. All right. Nobody believes they ever truly ruled um, inside where Riyadh is and where the Saudis came in the 20th century to build Saudi Arabia. Um, but they did police the, the ports. Their great rival in the Middle East was always Iran, okay, over further to the east. All right, so much of my understanding of today's politics in the Middle East is um, tied to the history of the Ottoman Empire, uh, now uh, weakened by the 19th century to hold on to its power, and then the aftermath of the demise of that empire in World War I, and the hasty construction of states by European powers. And I'm sure by reading newspapers and so on, you all are somewhat aware of a similar process that took place in Africa and how borders were you know, created in the most inopportune places and people were lumped together who had never lived together and told they should now be a nation. Similar dilemmas and problems and traumas uh, have afflicted the Middle East uh, in the 20th century with the overlay of great power politics, right? Um, because since World War I, attention has focused heavily on the Middle East for two reasons. One, oil, right? World War I was the first war in which the British Navy fought using oil for its ships, okay? They switched over from coal, right? And uh, they're very interested in uh, securing control over the first oil wells in southern Iran, southern Iraq. Um, they're later developed in what is now Saudi Arabia, right? So the process of creating nations is complicated immediately in the Middle East by the influence of foreign powers and the interest in the industrializing economies of the world in gaining access to that fossil fuel. The second complication has been the Arab-Israeli conflict. During World War I, 
uh, the British promised Zionists in England uh, that once they conquered that part of the Ottoman Empire, that is historically Israel, um, that uh, was the home of about 700,000 Arabs and about 63,000 Jews at the time, uh, that there would be a Jewish homeland. Right? Um, European history before World War I had already given strong signals of the kind of political violence uh, that would be amplified under Hitler in the 1930s. And the Zionist movement was looking for a refuge and a meaningful refuge to build their nation. Part of the surprise in my book in understanding the overlay of this complication internationally um, uh, with the complication of oil is that um, the Zionists were in good or you might agree bad company uh, as they came in to build uh, their own home in Palestine after World War I. Because World War I and the demise of the Ottoman Empire had you know, just torn apart a very multicultural society that had survived for 400 years under Ottoman rule, a society in which what is today Turkey was half Christian. Greeks and Armenians live there. Today, Turkey is 99% Muslim, right? Um, this was an era when, in all good intention, our own President Woodrow Wilson said, every nation, even small nations, deserve a state. That's great. People deserve to rule themselves and they should consent. You know, there's the idea of self-determination in World War I, right? But what's a nation? And there's a lot of, oh, oh no, <laughs> that I shouldn't have done. Um, uh, well, that, that uh, a lot of violence, we'll put it that way, a great demonstration of, uh, you know, elbowing aside people and saying, oh my God, if I don't claim at the Paris Peace Conference a country called Turkey, somebody else is going to claim it. And indeed, in 1919, we'll see in a minute, the Greeks invaded. Uh, at the city of Izmir, then called Smyrna by Greeks, to claim Western Anatolia. The Italians and the French had occupied the southern coast. Armenians were appealing for an Armenian state out in the east, past the Y in Turkey, right? And Europeans were talking about giving Turks only a tiny state around Ankara, taking Istanbul away from them. Russia had always wanted Istanbul and, and access to the Bosphorus Straits anyway, and so on. Turks thought they were going to be wiped off the map. So too did um, the Arabs, all right? As Turks thought they were going to you know, be wiped off the map, they pushed Armenians out in what most historians in the United States will term a genocide. The Turkish Republic insists it was not. We won't go into that controversy today. I spare you that. But nonetheless, there is a mass and deadly expulsion of Armenians. Up to a million of them died. They were moved out into the deserts of Syria and Iraq. Most didn't make it, right? Uh, a Kurdish population remained there that were told they were not allowed to be Kurds. They must be mountain Turks, right? Because the only way that Turks thought they could stay on the map was to show that they had a Turkish nation, right? And that there'd be no minority that an outside power would come in to protect and therefore undermine Turkish rule. And so in the same dilemma faced the Arab peoples of the Ottoman Empire after World War I. Um, who's seen the movie Lawrence of Arabia? Ah, oh, good. I have a reference point for all of you then. Uh, in the movie Lawrence of Arabia, the army is moving up past the S in Saudi uh, Arabia towards what is now Jordan and Palestine to the Gulf of Aqaba sort of south of where the J in Jordan is there, right? Uh, they want to eventually get to Damascus. They've announced an Arab revolt against Turkish rule. The British are supporting them. And Lawrence tells Faisal, the leader of the Arab revolt, that we will, we will guarantee that you will get an Arab state uh, you know, if you help us fight the Ottoman Turks. Well, of course, they got more than one state. Right? The British and the French battled for control. They both wanted a uh, payoff, if you will, for winning World War I. And so the French got Syria and Lebanon, and the British took Iraq, Jordan, and Palestine and split them up into countries. And many Arabs said, why are you splitting us up? 
we belong, you know, we'd be one state, right? Uh, and that bitterness underlies much of what we're going to talk about today and much of what people are trying to retrieve in 2011, 2012, 2013 with the Arab Spring, right? The feeling that they'd been betrayed, promises were not kept by the international community after World War I. The British had promised a state and took it away. They made them colonies. They had understood they'd get an independent state and it'd be one. If you look at the space in the Arab view, the territory covered by Jordan, Iraq, Syria, Palestine, that would have held the same number of people as lived in Turkey, Iran, or Egypt. It would have been a state on the same scale as the others. And so they felt they were unjustly divided in order to be controlled. Arabs were not dumb. They had seen European empires in the 19th century colonized through methods of divide and rule. And this is what they saw and understood was happening to them. The injustice, and World War I is really the pivot point in my book, okay, comes in part uh, because Woodrow Wilson, too, had stood up and guaranteed that they would be consulted and that they would consent to whoever ruled them or, you know, if they chose independence. But that's, they had translated all of his speeches into Arabic and published it in the newspapers and hailed him, you know, and tried to go to Paris to, you know, claim, make good on the promises he made. And the British and French didn't even let them go to Paris, right? They were shut out. So too was a little footnote, Ho Chi Minh, right? <laughs> Who was a dishwasher in Paris at the time and tried to get a hearing uh, for his own people in Indochina, right? He would go back to Indochina, uh, become a communist, and you know the story, lead us into um, our own conflict with Vietnam in the 1960s, all right? So for the Arab world, as in much of the world, then the, the uh, Paris Peace Conference was a disappointment on a scale shared, really, with the Germans. And you're all, I'm sure, somewhere in a textbook, have you know, read about how the Germans responded to the settlement after World War I. Um, they did not feel they should pay, pay the re reparations that were imposed on them. France was bound and determined to punish them for uh, their aggression. Um, they were disarmed, but this fueled a very ugly kind of politics, right? The Nazi movement uh, by the late 1920s in Germany. Um, by comparison, just to keep in some perspective, there were no viable fascist movements that emerged in the Arab world. There were young groups that admired Hitler for being a strong ruler, uh, but, and they wore shirts and made parades and so on. Uh, but there was none of the racist ideology. There was none of the aggressive ideology of recapturing territory. There was, it was used in service of gaining independence uh, more than anything else. All right, so this is, uh, the, uh, you know, all was supposed to be, ah. As I'm a graduate student then and I'm learning about all of this history, the Cold War ends. I say, oh, maybe the Cold War was also a moment of uh, import in the Middle East. Uh, this is 1990, the wall has come down. I found this cartoon. Uh, at the bottom it says, the West's current enemy, the West's former enemy. Okay, it's a translation of the Arabic there. And that Islamists have just stepped right into the shoes of communists as enemy number one of the West. And as uh, evil uh, uh, forces in the world that must be stopped at all costs. Right? I thought, the, I, I, looking back, I think the cartoon was somewhat um, prescient. It uh, uh, captures a tendency often in the press as well as in policy making to turn peoples into two dimensions. Right? As, you know, and, and when somebody's two dimensional and they're just bad, they are just Hitler all over again. You can look at the History Channel for all the ways that Saddam Hussein is exactly like Hitler, right? Um, you know, you don't have to ask questions about them once you've designated them as an enemy, right? They're, they're just bad and they must be removed. Uh, and in some ways, uh, there have been those who have formulated our policy uh, who have looked at Islamists in that way. I think that there have been other voices in government as well that, are, that hear the uh, nuances of history and the nuances of politics a little bit more um, with a little bit more uh, care uh, and uh, that policy does not have to involve 
the fabrication of two-dimensional enemies, but I fear that uh, the, the U.S. has uh, unfortunately fallen prey to that tendency. Um, quickly, that's my first book, Colonial Citizens, The Republican Rights, Paternal Privilege, and Gender in French, Syria, and Lebanon. It looks at Syria and Lebanon under the French right after World War I, okay? And what surprised me in that book was the array of movements that called themselves nationalist, uh, socialist, communist. There were liberals as well, but also Islamic, who all rose up, build movements against French rule, right? And when I looked at their platforms, what did they call for? Representative government, rule of law, and some level of social justice, all right? Uh, and I think that probably also laid the groundwork for writing Justice Interrupted. To be surprised that the response to French rule was to claim uh, uh, their rights as citizens uh, and to insist upon free elections and fair treatment under the law. Unfortunately, French rule was far from that. The French relied on thugs and toughs to assert control. You can imagine it was very hard to go into France and Lebanon after World War I and assert control when you knew you were not wanted. Woodrow Wilson had sent a commission to Syria, the King Crane Commission, to poll people, and they all said, no, we don't want France. And that, that report was pocketed until 1922, okay? So um, when you're in a situation and you can make the analogies you like to uh, more recent histories in the United States with Afghanistan and um, Iraq, right? You need to get in and stabilize things fast. And what the French did was call in their colonial officials who had experience, right? They went to tribal chiefs, chiefs up in the north. They went to religious patriarchs and to large landowners who could control peasants. These are influential figures in the society. They cultivated them. They awarded them grants of land, offices in government, so on. Right? And they controlled the population and made sure, you know, tap down uh, revolts and so on. But think of that list now. Tribal chiefs, landlords, religious patriarchs. These are not the most democratic element, elements in any society, uh, particularly that society. All right? These were people who were very happy the Ottoman Turks were gone, that that strong state that had been imposing a kind of direct role of the state in the society was gone. They were reclaiming their local powers and they were using France to do it, okay? Um, and so the people I looked at there were arranged against France and saying, we want to be Republican like you French. Why are you depriving us of Republican government, you know, and bringing back all these old patriarchal, uh, you know, people to rule over us and uh, to deprive us of our rights? Uh, a conclusion I came, you can see I looked a bit at gender, that is a picture, by the way, um, that appeared in a magazine in 1943 in Lebanon. And uh, if you know Lebanese history, you would know that, or might recognize that that is uh, Pierre Jamayo. He is the founder of the Falange. It's a Christian militia. And uh, the woman sitting down on the ground doesn't look Lebanese terribly much at all, but she's wearing the Phrygian cap of the French Revolution, uh, right? And so it is um, a sword with sort of Republican, you know, ideals of the revolution mixed together with the cedar of Lebanon and their shield, right? Um, which now leads me to my new book because implicit in that image is somehow a connection between power and sovereignty, the sword, and those republican ideals, right? That I finally discovered, I was knocking my head through, why were people, why were the largest movements in the late 19th century, early 20th century Middle East, constitutional movements. What did we see in constitutions? And I realized what glued together so many different people, different persuasions, whether they were Islamically oriented, whether they were Christians, whether they were women, men, upper class, lower class workers, and so on, was a belief that constitutional government would be strong government and would protect the people from foreign influence. It was also an understanding after unbridled colonialism had spread over the region in the 19th century, they needed protection from foreigners. They needed a constitutional government who would establish and maintain rule of law, not dole out privileges to every foreigner who came in and wanted to make a buck, um, and, uh, and lead them into the 20th century for the prosperity of their own people. That is what glued those, co co those coalitions together, right? 
So here we are, a man voting, 1958 in Syria. Uh, uh, a colleague of mine uh, who is Syrian at UVA tells me he must be from Aleppo. She can tell by the make of his shirt. <laughs> Uh, but he is clearly a, a more lower class or rural person. He's dressed in more, uh, you know, traditional clothing, and he is writing out the, uh, a ballot. The anomaly of that picture is that there was supposed to be secret balloting in Syria, and it looks like his friends are looking right over his shoulder as he makes his choice. Okay, quickly. So, the book tells you, should you want to get detail and ever read it, um, I'm giving you a very broad overview and we'll get to the Arab Spring. Uh, the 19th century up to World War I as a long process in which the old patrimonial Ottoman Sultan's system of justice, where you can see that tower sticking up at Topka. Anybody been to Istanbul? Beautiful, huh? One of the prettiest uh, cities in the world, particularly in the last 10 years they've really cleaned it up. Um, but that tower is right at the old palace of the Ottoman sultans, and it's called the Tower of Justice. And they intended the people of the city to see that tower. The Ottomans ruled, and it's amazing. The man to your left is a man named uh, Mustafa Ali, who wrote uh, sort of political treatises in the late 16th century. How often that word justice appears, all right? And uh, I realized that for the Ottomans, Justice was the byword of good government and legitimacy in, and the currency of political debate, if you will, right? Uh, that uh, are we being just is the question. You know, is this law just and so on, right? In much the way I think my old professor Columbia would say the word freedom is the byword of American politics, or the key word, right? Eric Foner, expert on civil war, looked and wrote a book through the decades of American history at the different ways that groups have used the concept of freedom to advance their political cause. And I think justice is the same key word for people in the Middle East. And it takes on different meanings. For sultans, it meant the sultan, the great patriarch, will bestow justice on his people, right? He is the viceroy of God on earth. He will interpret Islamic law, divine law, for the welfare of all of his subjects, right? And it is the duty of the subjects to be very good and productive, be nice peasants who will produce crops that can be taxed so that we can build an army and defend this great just realm of the Ottoman Empire. And indeed, this was a very statist economy. Prices were controlled to ensure that everybody could buy their bread and vegetables and so on. Uh, guilds had, uh, had to report to the government on uh, you know, how much everybody was being paid and so on. Equity was the byword there, not efficiency. Right? They were not capitalist. And in retrospect, many Turks write how terrible they were that way. But uh, one nice byproduct of this patrimonial form of justice in the Ottoman Empire is you did not have a wealthy bourgeoisie or landed aristocracy as you did in England, for example that block the power of the government um, and that exploited uh, the serfs, all right? Indeed, the Ottomans dismantled feudal economies as they conquered the territories of, south, of the Balkans. They ruled the Balkans in the Middle East, okay? All right, uh, on your left is an heir to Mustafa Ali. Now we're jumping way up to the beginning of the 19th century. I'm not gonna bore you with all that old, old history. But his name is Mustafa Rashid Pasha, um, and he wrote a decree in 1839 that is termed the Ottoman Bill of Rights. By this time, the Ottomans could not field an army that could take on and defeat Europe, all right? Europeans had surged ahead um, with the growth of capitalism, the sheer amount of tax revenue that France could, for example, France had the same number of people as the Ottoman Empire, right? And France collected four times the amount of tax revenue as the Ottomans and could hence build a big army. They had sent Napoleon to conquer Egypt in 1798, a chilling wake up for the Ottoman Empire that uh, they could no longer defend their nice garden of Islam and its justice. So Mustafa Rashid Pasha retools the whole idea of justice and promotes the idea of a prosperous empire 
where the rule of law reigns, where everyone's property is guaranteed to them, the state will not confiscate your property, right? And he even breathed the word equality under the law. Even Christians would be equal to Muslims. Right? Their goal was to build a liberal market economy. They figured the only way we're gonna be able to afford a big army is to encourage lots of people to become business people so we can tax them, okay? They threw out the window the old patrimonial model of Ottoman justice and embraced the modern world economy, basically, in the hope of saving their empire. The downside, serfs and so on, were not going to, or the presence would not uh, be as well protected uh, by the government uh, as they once were. And so on your right is a picture of muleteers. These are trains of mules uh, that would go from village to village in one of the more remote corners of the Ottoman Empire, Mount Lebanon. And believe it or not, in 1858, muleteers like this led a peasant revolt against feudal landlords who, now less controlled by the Ottoman government, were gouging the uh, peasants with uh, extra taxes, forced labor, and so on. And they won. They set up a peasant republic from 1858 to 1860 in Lebanon, and they invoked the principles of reform that Mustafa Rashid Pasha had announced in 1839. So the word of the new regime, in Turkish it's called the Tanzimat, the reforms, okay, even reached the ears of peasants in Mount Lebanon. And what fascinated me is that we have letters from those peasants in 1858 claiming that they are equal to those feudal lords under the law and demanding that they choose their own representative to the governor, not have the feudal lord appoint one for them, okay? So even common people have embraced this idea of rule of law and equality. I end the first part of the book with um, uh, the growth of two uh, well, constitutional movements around the Middle East, but I focus on two. On your left is a picture of Colonel Ahmed Urabi, uh, who led a revolution in Egypt in 1881 and 82. And on the right is a picture of the Iranian parliament in 1910. There was a constitutional revolution in Iran from 1906 to 1911, all right, uh, in which a real constitutional monarchy was set up. Uh, the revolutionaries had to fend off a civil war started by the Shah, who was not happy to have powers taken away from him, right? Um, it was led and supported, you're going to be surprised, by imams, by religious leaders of Tehran, who looked at the tyranny of the Shah and said, that is un-Islamic, all right? Injustice most often in modern Middle Eastern politics is seen as tyranny. And in fact, it has very deep roots. Scholars who do Islamic law and religious writings have written about how the opposite of justice in much writing is tyranny. And that the lesser evil would be to have a secular government in which Iranians sat in a parliament and formulated laws, all right? Even the top ayatollahs in the holy city of Najaf, which is now in Iraq, right, supported the constitutional revolution. It ended because the, the Russians to the north did not like it. <laughs> The, the parliament tried to assert control over their budget. The, uh, the Russians had been skimming uh, you know, funds off and had their own sort of royal uh, collaborators in Iran, and they were able to shut down the Constitutional Revolution in 1911. Ahmed Orabi in Egypt, another really interesting case. When you know, you, you, you're, you're surprised. You're reading this text and you say, wait a second, he can't be saying that in 1882, and indeed he is. He says he led the revolution because of the racism of the Turkish elite against the Egyptians, the Arabic-speaking Egyptians. He was a colonel, and they would not let him take higher office, right? He joined up with landowners. Ah, in a classic moment akin to the French Revolution of 1789, the Egyptian government is bankrupt. They built the Suez Canal, but they're so far in debt that they have to sell the whole canal to the British and so on. And the monarch, who is under the Ottoman sultan, but autonomous in Egypt, okay? Uh, the monarch calls the landowners together in a kind of estates general to ask for more tax revenues. 
And the landowners are fit to be tied. And they said, well, we're not going to give you taxes unless we can control how you spend the money. We want a parliament. We want control over the budget. And so they link up with the guys in the military, and they conduct uh, this revolution. They ruled in Egypt for only two months, however. Uh, the monarch called in the British, and the British came in, uh, worried that the revolutionary government would not pay back the monarch's debts, right? And they invaded and defeated Orabi. Uh, he only had a peasant army. He didn't have, you know, anyway, they, you know, he didn't have the full army that he could have had. Um, and uh, he was sent off to exile in Malta, okay? So <laughs> uh, that was the end. And so this is, what's interesting is that, um, I guess I have to speak through here, that um, when I went to Cairo during the 2011 Arab Spring, people remembered Urabi, right? He has been inscribed in textbooks in Egypt as a great freedom fighter, as a man who stood up for justice, who was of peasant origin, very important in Egypt. You know, uh, you know the Arabs are amongst the most egalitarian peoples you can find, right? Um, and... Uh, they, they saw themselves as retrieving something that had been lost. They certainly did not look at England as a country that had endowed them with any democracy, right? And so I realized as I was writing this book that I was sort of catching up to people's local textbooks, right? And their own memories of what had happened. Okay, here is just a map of what was the once at its greatest extent, including all the purple and the red and the brown of the Ottoman Empire and then the shrinkage of the empire to World War I. You with me? I'm not going to go too much longer. You've been great. Um, it is in the wake of the shrinking and then demise of the Ottoman Empire that part two of the book begins. All right. Now, however, people realize all those constitutions did not, in fact, defend them very well. They've been colonized by Britain and France, Italy, Greece, after the war. The Ottoman Empire was not strong enough to defend the territory despite its constitution. In the back of their minds was the example of Meiji Japan. In a famous war in 1905, the Meiji Japanese had defeated the Russian Tsar. And they said, ah, little Japan, constitutional, big Russia, not, that must be. And World War I poked a hole in that theory, if you will. It's very hard for anybody in the Middle East after 1918 to build a large popular political movement simply around constitutionalism anymore. All right. There's a last ditch attempt in Syria. Faisal from Lawrence of Arabia, remember him? He's played by Alec Guinness. <laughs> you know? okay. uh, he tries to set up a constitutional monarchy in 1920 in Damascus. All right in part to prove to the people in Paris, see we're modern, see we're democratic, we don't need any French advice in ruling, we can govern ourselves the way uh, Woodrow Wilson promised we might. Didn't work, right? The French wanted that territory and the French cavalry actually had to oust a, a, a reigning constitutional government in order to occupy Syria in 1920. I call that the last true grassroots constitutional movement until well after World War II in the Middle East. And indeed, the middle part of the book looks at how many of the biggest movements, again, my yardstick is just to look, what were the biggest movements? What, you know, what were the ideas that most people followed? They privileged collective security and a strong dictator, basically, over individual rights and liberalism. Liberalism had not protected them. And the logic seemed to be, and it could come in many forms. And this helped solve the mystery of my first book. Why did I see Islamists and uh, communists and uh, nas fat, you know, fat cat nationalists in Syria and Lebanon uh, advocating Republican government? Constitutionalism is still the language of justice, but the aim is to bring a kind of collective security to people. And it, so constitutionalism gets hitched to other programs. And I'll show you some examples quickly. One of my favorite people in the book is Halideh Adip. She's on the left. She was the first Muslim girl to go to the American school in Istanbul. And she's standing, you can't read it too well, uh, but 
she's standing in 1919 after Greece has invaded Anatolia uh, over a banner that says Wilson's 12th principle, or 12th point, pardon me. You remember he had these 14 points, right, in his speech? And the 12th point was that Turks should have their own state, all right? Uh, she was a real liberal, she was a journalist, uh, and uh, yet she gives a famous speech on that day in May 1919 to a crowd of a couple hundred thousand Turks, warning them, fearing their anger. British planes are buzzing up above, right? The, the Ottomans have been defeated only six months before. And she, she tells the people, stop, stop your anger, right? Peoples are not our enemies, governments are. She urged kind universal brotherhood, and yet she, had, she was straining to reconcile her fear for her country. What good is liberalism if I don't have a country, right? Um, and she said, we can only engage in nationalism defensively. Haile Deidi followed Mahatma Gandhi, uh, and indeed would go to India a few years later, right? Uh, so she, she's wrestling, but she signs on with nationalism. She joins Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, who fights and ousts the Greeks and creates the modern Republic of Turkey uh, in the next couple of years. However, the constitutional roots of the, in the Ottoman Empire and then in Turkey bear fruit in 1950, and that's the picture on the right, when the Democrat Party turns out of power the official party of Mustafa Kemal in fair elections. The first transition and changeover of power to an opposition party in all of the Middle East in the 20th century, okay? So there, Turkey's a success story, in part because it had sovereignty and it did not have oil. <laughs> Nobody cared and they were left to conduct their politics as they would. Also helped that the reigning party recognized if they want, were gonna get any aid after World War II from the US, they had to look democratic. Right, the Truman Doctrine had been issued and the fear of communism uh, persuaded them. Okay, here's the colonies, just to remind you, Green Egypt is, a, is ruled indirectly by Britain, Red, Transjordan, Palestine, Iraq, ruled by Britain as mandates after World War I, Syria and Lebanon by France. Let's look at Palestine very, very, very quickly. Um, on the left, can anybody guess who that is? No, it's not Lenin. <laughs> Anybody guess who that is? Anybody know their Israeli-Palestinian history? Yes, it is. He was trying to look like Lenin, by the way. He was a big labor leader. The year is 1924. They're laying a, uh, the cornerstone to something they called the House of Labor. And he rose to political power, much as any Tammany Hall boss in New York or anybody else would. He doled out jobs, right? Uh, helped immigrants settle, get, get them houses. Uh, and uh, built a virtual state within a state under British rule during the period of the British mandate in Palestine, which extended from 1920 to 1948, all right? So the British wink, wink, you know, they have, uh, they've uh, granted the right to a Jewish homeland and they allow Ben-Gurion using funds from abroad and the, the talents and manpower of the Jewish immigrants, particularly after the 1930s from Germany, right, to build a country. Uh, he never, however, intended to share the country with, on, the, on your right, as uh, an Arab delegation heading to London, right, to plead uh, with uh, Churchill and others in power there uh, for equal or just representation is what they called it in government. They wanted one man, one vote. But remember what I told you, there are 700,000 Arabs, there are less than 70,000 Jews at the beginning of the 1920s in Palestine. Ben-Gurion was not going to allow Jews to be another minority in another state, right? The whole reason they wanted a homeland was to be a majority. So collective security trumped liberal rights. In a period after World War I, where everybody felt they were gonna be wiped off the map. Right? The Turks thought they were going to be wiped off the map. The Arabs thought they were going to be wiped off the map. Well, the Palestinians will be wiped off the map. Right? Um, but it, is it was so interesting to me to read the tall, tall man sort of to the right is Musa Qasim Pasha. He is condemned today by many Palestinian historians for either even bothering to negotiate with the British. They argue that if old honorable men like that hadn't gone to London demanding their right Wilsonian rights, to self-rule um, and picked up a gun instead, maybe Palestinians would have a state today, 
right? Uh, so uh, the Palestinians were ill-equipped to meet the challenge of building a nation quickly, one that might advance uh, you know, its uh, cause and claim to existence in what is really a Darwinian world after World War I, all right? But this solidifies the, the sense that collective security should trump individual liberal rights. Uh, another two a contrasting examples that I include in the book quickly. Uh, on the left is Hassan al-Banna. Anybody know who Hassan al-Banna was? He, yes? Anybody? Egyptian, founder of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, 1928 Egypt. Okay? And um, he wrote a memoir that I used in the, in the book because it, tell, it was sort of the model of his life and the reasons founded the movement as an example to his followers, right, in the 1940s. Like, why you should be in the Muslim Brotherhood, what we're about. And he emphasizes greatly that he founded the Muslim Brotherhood in the town of Ismailia, which is on the Suez Canal in Egypt, right? And in the, he lived in the shadow, he was a school teacher, and he lived in the shadow of the big Suez Canal Company, not owned by Egyptians. Egyptians commonly claimed, I don't know if anybody's ever verified the numbers, that 100,000 Egyptians died building the Suez Canal. There were no bulldozers. They carried ba baskets of dirt, right? Um, they wore suits, government uniforms, jumpsuits, because the British claimed they were stealing the clothes. And so they'd write on the back, and this is the mid-19th century, W-O-G-S, Worker on Government Service. When I got to Egypt in 1982, there were British people who still referred to Egyptians as wogs. It, all right? It's a contemptuous term. It, you, know, you, you are just a wog, um, right? Uh, so he writes in the memoir and he talks about the riots and the revolution in Egypt in 1919, the effort to claim independence at that point, and the British refusing it, right? Uh, and so he builds this, the um, Muslim Brotherhood in 1928 partly under the inspiration, here's an intriguing link, of the most famous Islamic scholar reformer of the day. The man was Rashid Ridda. He happened to be, have been, in 1920, the president of the Constitutional Congress at Damascus that the French invaded and occupied. Rashid Ridda went to Cairo in exile uh, continued publishing his very famous magazine. It was called Al Manar, means um, the lighthouse. And uh, Hassan Obama went to Cairo for his higher learning and met him. And what I argue in the book is that an important but subtle shift has occurred. Banna does not reject constitutionalism. It still remains part of the program of a lot of these movements in the 1920s and 30s, even though. Right? World War I had shown that it wasn't going to defend your sovereignty, right? But the Muslim Brotherhood is premised on the idea that Islamic justice is different from European justice. It is a rejection of universal models of justice. Our Arabs, Turks, and Muslims around the world had bought into the idea of constitutionalism in the late 19th century on the premise that all great world civilizations share some fundamental principles. And that you, you know, good Islamic government would be based on principles that were not so different from Christian government in Europe, right? And that you could look into the scriptures of Islam, you know, of Islam and see uh, you know, precedents by the Prophet Muhammad himself for representative government, rule by law, equality, and so on, okay? Uh, Banna's movement represents a break with that. It is a movement that teaches its people, we have to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. European culture is only a Trojan horse for European control, right? What a break, a rupture in the, what I began the talk saying, the political culture of the region, all right? Directly due and linked to the debacle after World War I in the person of Rashid Rida, all right? And so, the one number one takeaway I hope my readers will have from the book is that a political culture that regards the West with a bit of suspicion, but which is ambivalent about constitutional government, there's, there are strong and deep roots about it, right? 
um, is rooted in an experience, an experience and a sense of betrayal, a sense that their justice has been interrupted. And I think that is probably the most important thing to understand about the origins of the Muslim Brotherhood, which, as you know, now rules in Egypt. Okay? Not that, it, that the Muslim Brotherhood was totally a democratic, wonderful, liberal uh, organization. Right? It, too, was part of that era in which collective security, and collective security meant homogeneity, keeping like with like, right? and building solidarity on shared norms, no more this multicultural flimsiness, the same kind of collective security that Mustafa Kemal insisted upon in uh, cleansing Anatolia of all Greeks and Armenians. Right? Um, only then can you have stability, loyalty, and solidarity and that will enable your nation to defend its sovereignty in this cruel world. All right? World War I was that devastating. World War I was, to the Middle East, what, say, the Civil War was to this country, with the long shadow that followed it, that it defined basic political grievances and cleavages in our society as it defined in the Eastern societies, and its consequences are still felt very directly in Middle Eastern politics today in organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood. Contrast over in Iraq, and for reasons you have to read the book for, I'm not gonna go into, it's not Islamic movements that gain dominance. Muslim, the Muslim Brotherhood becomes the biggest political organization, the first really modern political party, if you will, in the Middle East by the 1940s. There are 500,000 people who have joined it. That's huge in the Middle East, okay? The largest organization in Iraq is the Communist Party, led by Comrade Fahid, who is Christian. Bend your mind around it. Today, Iraq ruled by Shiites, right? He was Christian, born in the southern, well, not born, but grew up in the southern city of Basra, also, by the way, attended for a couple of years until his father died, an American school, a missionary school, right? Uh, but learned of communism because um, the British are ruling and there are ships coming in from India and there are English language magazines, communist magazines coming in with the sailors, right? Um, but I argue the reason the communists prevail are two, actually two reasons. One, he was the country bumpkin in the party. And when he goes up to Baghdad in, in the early 1930s, the sort of intellectual Marxists up there who have a comfortable living receive notice from Moscow, oh, we can offer you a scholarship for one of your members to come to the University of the Toilers of the East in Moscow, right? Lots of people went there, <laughs> you know, in the third world, okay? What he learned there was how to organize an underground movement. Nobody else in Iraq knew how. Iraq was ruled as a security state in the 20s and 30s, under, indirectly under the British after 1932. The British taught the Iraqi secret service and secret police all of their methods. Abu Ghraib was the site of torture in the 1940s when the British were there. Indeed, a British official headed up the security police in Iraq. You could not field a legal opposition party in Iraq. But if you knew how to build an underground movement, you could. And so I argue that is part of the number one reason why Fahid and the communists become the biggest party by 1948 in Iraq. Number two reason is that the communists, because they did not identify themselves as an ethnic or religiously based group, could open a wide umbrella. They had Kurds, Sunnis, Shi'is, Arabs, uh, Christians, you name it, Jews, there were lots of anti-Zionist Jews who were you know, in leadership positions in that Iraqi Communist Party. And if you look at the platform that he publishes in 1945, it looks like a welfare state. You know, It's got, we want our rights, we want a parliament, we want a, const we want a true constitution that gives the parliament power, and we want to redistribute wealth to all the poor peasants out there. You know, um, it, yes, it is possible that Fahad thought there would be a second stage of the revolution in which the workers would gain control of the state, but that was a distant second. The belief in the 1940s is that Arabs were not ready for a full-fledged Soviet-style state, right? And so he was, the reason all those people joined the Communist Party in Iraq was they thought they were fighting for a welfare state with a real Bill of Rights, okay? 
They didn't know about the secret agenda for the later workers' revolution, if you will, all right? That was a surprise. I did not actually expect to find that when I set out writing the book. Indeed, I thought other scholars had argued, oh, constitutionalism and liberal ideas died after World War I, and I'm finding them healthy, but wrapped in a new wrapping. Communist workers, uh, you know, unite. Um, and so these are two different responses to the same problem of British colonial rule after World War I in two different countries, Egypt and Iraq, okay? And both of them retain liberal elements. Finally, part three of the book <laughs> it concerns the effects of the Cold War. This is going to be really short, but we can pick it up in the Q&A, okay? Um, by the early 1960s, and I'm not going to go into detail, but basically the Middle East is divided between military dictators supported by the Soviets and nice kings divided and supported by the U.S. That's putting it very broadly, but generally that's, uh, you know, I argue that the era of open politics is over, right? Um, and you have repressive regimes that are puppets of these cold powers that, that fought, again, shut down political freedom and political arenas, okay? Um, so what happens to politics after that, right? Many people point to, well, that's why we get an Islamic resurgence, and indeed, uh, we'll talk about that, that's a, the, one root of the Islamic revolution in Iran, right, is that the Shah, supported by the U.S., um, uh, was very repressive, and um, it's, it, you know, the Shah would not dare to come after you if you were inside a mosque, right? That was a safe pace, place to gather. Think space. Think about this meeting. Could we be talking about this if we could not find a space to meet, right? I mean, there are the basic things about why then it's um, uh, ayatollahs who get a voice in political opposition and not somebody else. These kids uh, at the Tehran University tended to be Marxists, to a greater or lesser degree, uh, Islamically inclined, right? Uh, but also at the beginning of that revolution, calling for a restoration of the Constitution, the old 1906 Constitution. That is what started the Iranian Revolution, right? Um, in the middle is uh, that older man was a man who was toppled by a CIA plot in 1953 for trying to restore the Constitution and for, I will say, nationalizing the oil company. <laughs> All right, long before Fidel Castro came along to nationalize American companies, uh, Mohammad Mossadegh had uh, nationalized the Iranian oil company that, had, that the British considered to be their own property. Um, and in the hands of a student on the left there is a man named Ali Shariati, um, S-H-A-R-I-A-T-I. And he was the sort of big man on campus, the real, he started a big student movement in which he preached that Islam is a religion of revolution and is a religion of the poor. And he mobilized a slogan about fighting a revolution for the poor that Khomeini picked up. And so when the revolution finally came to a head, it was Khomeini using Shariati slogans that um, toppled the Shah. On the left, anybody recognize anybody there? This is the PLO. In the center, at the center is a man named Abu Yad. Um, he was the right hand man to uh, Yasser Arafat in Fatah. All right? And so I revisited the history of the PLO in part as um, the uh, most extreme case of a political movement trying to organize when it doesn't even have a political arena, right? This was, they organized Palestinian refugees in camps in multiple different countries, right? So, um, and I talk about, I won't go into now, but I put, I understand and look at the turn to political violence and terrorism by the PLO in that context, all right? Politics had no place else to go. There was no parliament to go to. There was no international agency. If, you don't, if you're not a state, you don't have standing in the UN. Right? So, finally, Arab Spring. <laughs> okay? And uh, on the left is the Freedom Wall in Iraq. Okay? From the earlier era of constitutional government, the monarchy was toppled in 1958. And I love the fact that Iraqis today go to that place uh, to stage their protests. Okay? And on, on your right is the uh, election of Morsi as president of Egypt. Uh, in Tahrir Square, and um, I cut it off, but part of that poster just to the 
left of his head is actually a balance, you know, a weight, a, a scale, like the balance of justice. So um, interesting continuities of motifs. Uh, and let me just do very briefly in Syria, what I'm going to ask you to just ask questions um, because we've gone over time. This is Akram Hurani, co-founder of the modern, the political Ba'ath Party of the 1950s. He was the first person in the Middle East to organize peasants in Syria. Peasants in Syria lived as poorly as, think of the worst days of poverty in Appalachia in the United States. That's the level these peasants lived on. He was the only man in government who paid attention to agricultural economy. Everybody else was a fat cat, right? Left over from the French period. So after the French left in 1946, he got the idea, and this is why it's fun to be in a history department like this, to organize peasants and enfranchise them. And we would unseat the big fat cats, the landowners and the tribal chiefs from parliament by getting them out to vote, like that picture on the cover of my book, right? And so my friend Grace Hale, who teaches Southern history, says, Oh, you know, they tried that same thing in the South in the 1930s. Didn't work. <laughs> then I tell a friend of mine who is a political scientist about this effort in the 1940s and 50s by Harani, and he goes, oh, if he had read all the political science that has been written in the past 50 years, he'd know that never works. You can never unseat a landed aristocracy by parliamentary regimes. It just hasn't happened. Nobody can do it. Somebody in the elite has to go over to your side. Right? It can't happen through the ballot box. Never did, never will, according to him. But poor Akram Hurani didn't know that. And um, I know about his story because he wrote a 3,000-page memoir, which took a whole summer to read in Arabic. Right? Why did he read that 3,000 pages? I'm thinking, why all this detail? Why all this extra history? I asked my friend, remember the friend in the in UVA who knows uh, in, in, that the shirt, the man voting, war is from Aleppo. I said, well, you know, you know about Akram Hurani? Akram who? Akram Hurani has been erased from Syrian history. He is a co-founder of the Ba'ath. He helped rule in a, a government in the mid-1950s that was probably the most democratic ever in Syria. Erased from history, all right? He came from this town, Hama. He defended these peasants. There he is way on the right, sitting in parliament, unseated. Cold War dictatorships by an old friend, Adib Shishakli. Regained power, there he is fighting in parliament. He was, some people have compared him to Huey Long. He was a real populist, a real you know, dynamo in parliament. There he is with the co-founder of the original Ba'ath Party, a school teacher named Michel Aflac. Yes, Christian, who united Christian, Muslim, all the minorities around their common um, Arabic language on the basis of equality, right? And they were constitutional, Cold War politics. Here they are fighting against the fat cats thought they would unite with the monarchy in Iraq and uh, kind of, you know, and the Ba'ath Party was very Republican. They said, no, we want our republic. We don't want to unite. But in 1957, the Eisenhower Doctrine was issued. <laughs> and uh, the word was out that Eisenhower would give money to anybody who would topple left-leaning regimes, particularly Syria. You know, because Akram Harani, unfortunately, used the word socialist for his program, for his peasants. And so there's the Syrians, you know, showing their hardware. Uh, they called the Egyptians to get, the, get some more weapons. But NATO troops lined up on the border with Syria and Turkey. Turkey is now part of NATO. And Akram Harani is deathly afraid that NATO will invade Syria, right? And so he goes and he throws, as Speaker of Parliament, he throws Syria into the arms of uh, Nasser, in Egypt. Gamal al Nasser had a staged revolution in Egypt and was a dictator. The Ba'ath Party never liked him because he was a dictator. But in the name of that collective security, Arab nationalism and the sharing of weapons in a world where it looked again like Syria was going to be occupied only a decade after the French had left, he proclaimed the United Arab Republic with Egypt. Within months, of uniting with Egypt, Nasser banned not only the Communist Party, but the Ba'ath Party as well. And that was the end of Akram Hurani's career. In 1963, the Syrians, hating the dictatorship so much, um, overthrew the Egyptian regime, regime, kicked them out. But this time, it was a secret military Ba'ath Party, completely 
Well, I'm going to show you. Here he is in Parliament. There's the vote in 1958. There's the great <laughs> victory parade with Nasser. Um, oh, and these are the peasants that will benefit from Akram Harani, but I don't have the picture in this version of the uh, PowerPoint. I apologize. Um, one of the followers of Akram Harani in the original Ba'ath Party was a man named Hafez al-Assad, who was amongst the, who went to military school and, and you know, had a career in the Air Force and joined the military wing of the Ba'ath Party. It was his military Ba'ath Party that kicked Akram Harani out of Syria in 1963. The very peasants that Harani had brought into politics kicked him out. He wrote his 3,000 word page memoir in a small apartment outside of Paris with a shotgun by the door. All right, agents of the Ba'athist regime were on his path and on the watch for him. He was never let back into the country, uh, died over the border in Jordan, pleading with Hafez al-Assad to let him in um, in his dying days, but he would not let him do so. But I argue that it is the legacy of these people that fuels both sides, all sides of the conflict in Syria right now. And it is these people and the memory of these people that make Arabs both, on one hand, want to embrace Obama, want to embrace the ideals of Americans, but at the same time, make them very suspicious because they have seen the consequences, first of British and French intervention and then of American intervention run counter to their ideals of justice themselves. Thank you for your very much patience and long ears. Um, if you have the energy, I will answer questions. Watch out for the puddles. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Very uh, it was the most enlightening and right to the point for all the things that we wanted to do and consider, uh, consider in this uh, particular program. Thank you very, very much. You're absolutely welcome. My pleasure. I, I know you had to go for a class. Yeah, it, it, it's just about uh, oh, 1230 you now. Five, five, ten minutes of questions? Sure, we can do that. Okay. I yeah. have, I'm sure worn you all out. You all have other things to do. If, if uh, there are any... You're welcome to email me with questions if you don't want to stay. Sure. And if, if we have, uh, if she has time for questions, we have time for questions. If you would queue up over here at this microphone, we'll be able to get it both on the video and people will be able to hear it. Uh, I had one question that um, if we're going to have justice under law, and it looks like it might be Islamic law, what do we need to consider about between the difference between the Sunni and the Shia in, in who's going to have and formulate what kind of law is going to come out, particularly in, in Egypt or any of these other countries? Mm, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, the, you know, it, it, law is, as you all know, we're all listening to the news about what's going on at the Supreme Court right now, right? Um, a matter of interpretation often, right? Uh, and so, and those who have argued that Islamic law it can be reconciled with democratic government believe that, right? There are people within even the Muslim Brotherhood who believe that. Uh, at the moment, however, there are those who have an upper hand, an older generation in the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, who have, we think, probably cut a deal with the security apparatus and the army, uh, who are not so inclined to open up politics um, uh, in the way that me uh, many Muslim brothers have argued ought to be, younger ones and people outside of it. So in a sense, they have been seen by those who inhabited Tahrir Square two years ago to betray the uh, intention of the Arab Spring there, which, as you may or may not know, was sparked by the beating of a young man uh, in an, uh, you know, who was sitting in an internet cafe by a security police force that had gone completely out of control. They did operated completely outside of the law. And unfortunately in Egypt that has not been dismantled. And that's not a matter of Islam. It sounds like um, from the best observers that I've been able to talk to and read um, comes about because in part I showed you the picture of Morsi's election. You know, the army withheld the results of that election for a couple weeks. And there was a lot of backroom dealing to just get Morsi in. Um, and so we think that a deal with the devil was made and that, uh, you know, that is uh, as much a reason as any um, anti-democratic feeling uh, within the ranks of the uh, leaders of the Muslim Brothers. That said, the elections themselves also produced this result 
because everybody I know, I was there for part of the parliamentary elections at the end of 2011, uh, was surprised to find that Salafis, very right-wing, conservative Muslim groups, did so well, they got 25% of the vote. And so they have entered the equation of politics. And just as you know, for a while, the Tea Party was able to shift agendas in this country. That has been the wild card in Egypt. But again, I'm looking at the political process, not some certain values of Islam at all, right? Another story in a place like Iraq, where you actually have a mix of Sunnis and Shia. You know, you don't really have many Shi'is in Egypt. It's just all Sunni Islam. So you don't have a conflict in terms of, um, uh, the corpus of the law uh, or sectarian identity. Iraq is a dicier proposition, right? The, the, the Shia are uh, a, the largest single group in Iraq, uh, as they are in Lebanon. And in both places, they were excluded from politics by the British and French after World War I. And part of what we're seeing in the growth of the Hezbollah and now Nouri al-Maliki's government you know, is keen memory of having been excluded and joy at being able to uh, uh, you know, flex muscle, except that in both countries, you have many different religious groups, right? You can, it, it's, it's, it's impossible to even conceive that an Islamic state could rule over countries that have a large, uh, particularly if Lebanon has a large number of Christians, but Iraq has a large number of Sunnis, both Kurdish and Arab, right? So this is very much a process in transition uh, they know they cannot build a regime like that in Iran, but then again, geopolitics, and Iran is right next door, so we know why we're seeing what we're seeing. But I guess the short answer is then, there's nothing inherently in the Islamic law or in being Muslim, I think, at work, but that we can just see politics as usual. I'll try to make it very short. Uh, part of my question was what was just approached, the difference between the sectarian violence between Sunnis and Shia. Uh, why is it doesn't seem to be an, a factor in the Muslim Brotherhood as much, at least as far as I know. Why has the Islamic Brotherhood not taken hold in Iraq, for instance, as it has in Egypt? And following up to that is, uh, shouldn't the so-called West, Western powers, just kind of step back, except for the oil, of course, uh, to let this whole thing sort itself out and to let the, Islam the various Islamic countries figure out where they're going to end up mm -hmm. after practically centuries of interference that led to no good end. Mm -hmm. What would be the problem there? Right. Oh, great. Two really good questions. The Muslim brothers are Sunni by definition. They did inspire in uh, Gaza Strip, Hamas, right? And interestingly, for a time, Hamas worked with the Shiites of Hezbollah and you know, Iran funneled aid to them. So when in their political interest, they could cooperate, right? Now they're not. Um, it's not in their political interest any longer, um, and they won't. But um, a short answer, maybe it's too facile, um, is that uh, why the Muslim Brothers never gained, actually I'll give you two reasons why, uh, a foothold in Iraq. One, Sunnis are, uh, Sunni, it, it's seen as an Arab organization, so Kurds were not as drawn to it. And when you look at the number of Sunni Arabs in Iraq, that is a minority in the population. Um, there are many very religious people in Iraq who sympathize with the ideas of the Muslim Brotherhood may have been in some capacity membered, uh, members of local cells, uh, but they uh, would not wield the same political power as Sunni Muslims. It is interesting that amongst the officers who overthrew the Iraqi monarchy in 1953 were Ba'athists who were very religious and may have sympathized with these ideas, but uh, they chose to, and for reasons that are not hard to see, to build uh, an overtly secular regime uh, so as to claim uh, a majority support as, Arab, uh, as an Arab regime, mainly. Your second question, why doesn't the West have... Well, I, I think you could gather that um, uh, the implication of the book is um, that 
interference, well, I, I see good and, good and bad kinds of interference, but mostly, you know, um, uh, the effort to move in has only tarnished those that you work with as traders to the country, that, that cult, the political culture of local cultural solidarity uh, against the West is too strongly implanted since World War I, uh, that you cannot come in simply acting as though you re represent some nonpartisan universal you know, set of human rights, right? That said, there are human rights groups. And I do ask at the end of the book, are we seeing a struggle in the Arab Spring to return to a kind of universal, globally shared standard of justice? And that may be at work. But there is a lot, of, uh, a lot of issues and a lot of commitment to seeking strength through the local cultural solidarity that has to be worked through before that will you know, come to the fore and dominate. So you're absolutely right, I would say. Uh, on the other hand, I think there are things that could rightfully be done to support a more benign outcome. For example, I have not, maybe you have, seen much uh, in the press uh, about supporting and helping refugees. What a great place to start rebuilding some kind of bond with Syrians, uh, you know, to lend, you know, help to those who might organize uh, the refugees in the many camps and um, around uh, a more uh, democratic uh, political program, but also, most importantly, around survival, right? Um, have we heard much about the Iraqi refugees? You know, even those here in the United States who risk their lives for cooperating. Um, and it is those, the refugee issues are, the, are a sort of wild card that can, um, you know, uh, enter into the politics in, in a very negative way if we don't watch out. But wouldn't that be based on the fear of Islam in the Western world? If we help them, we don't know who's going to infiltrate. At least that's a big problem. Oh, you mean, you mean military aid? No, even uh, helping the refugees, the hundreds of thousands of refugees approaching a million mm -hmm. from Syria. Yes. Um, I'm German, and they have just agreed to take another 5,000 in. Mm -hmm. Well, 5,000 is nothing. But there's a huge fear in, in the Western world now that if we let them in, they might not ever, ever leave, or they might infiltrate us with militant Islamic ideas. I think that is that plays a role because they are Islamic refugees right. and not other nationalities. No, I can see that. And I would say that that's a wonderful way to end my talk because I began my career and the book with a concern about a reflex to treat people in two dimensions. They are Muslim, but think of all the Muslims in this country. And it is only certain, it is certain events and certain political conflicts that will uh, prompt people to choose a militant uh, political ideology over another uh, ideology is not simply because they're Muslim, right? Um, and I think by you know, reading through uh, the political history of all these different Muslims and some Christians uh, in, uh, in my book, I've become aware, I've become less worried about Muslims per se and more concerned about the situation that they find themselves in. Good, good thank point you. to end on. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all so much.